from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's now my pleasure to introduce Amy Riolo, an award-winning author, educator, lecturer, and culinary consultant who promotes learning and enjoying culture through cuisine. Riolo teaches that cuisine, culture, and history go hand in hand, and she seeks to accurately portray the three in all her work, which has been internationally recognized. Her publication, Nile Style, Egyptian Cuisine and Culture, marks the first cookbook devoted to the multi-ethnic and multi-religious history of the Egyptian table. The book contains 25 menus that include historical context in addition to providing more than 150 flavorful recipes, both new and old. The first edition of Nile Style won the World Gourmand Award for Best Arab Cuisine Book. Please join me in welcoming Amy Riolo. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. Can you all hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, this is my second book that I'm going to be talking about today, Nile Style. And creating this book has been quite a journey. So I'd like to take you in a little bit on this same journey with me. And what I'll be doing today is explaining a little bit about my involvement, how I became involved with Egypt, and why I became interested in writing this book. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the recipes as I do them. They each have very interesting stories. And by the time we end, I'd like to make some introductions and also to take your question and answers. So just out of curiosity, Is that better? Okay. And the people in the back, can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, how's this? I never have that problem, so this is the first time ever. <laughs> but so to going back and kind of my history and how I became involved. Okay. Now we need it up a little bit. How's this? A little more. So the first thing I'll do is, <laughs> apparently there's a fine line between too low and too high. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about how I became involved with Egypt. I went to Egypt for the first time in 1999. And as any good traveler, I did all my research, started getting you know, excited about my trip. And every book that I got my hands on said, Egypt has a lot of wonderful things to offer, but food isn't one of them. So I was scared to death because I wondered, you know, what was I going to eat when I was there and how the, how the whole experience would be. So my first two weeks in Egypt, I lived on white rice and mango because I figured you could boil the rice and you could peel the mango and I'd be safe. All the books talked about all the illnesses that you would get if you ate Egyptian food. So little by little, I met people, I started going into people's homes, and I realized how wonderful the food in the homes was, but also how much it was similar to a lot of the foods that we eat in Italy, which is my ancestral homeland, and Greece, and Turkey, and a lot of other places. And I said, you know, how come people haven't really written about this food? So I kind of took it upon myself to make it my role to introduce Americans to Egyptian cuisine. And this was in 1999. Fast forward to 2007, and I was doing a lecture at the Egyptian embassy, on how the three monotheistic faiths formed the cuisine of Egypt. And so when I was there, I was um, talking about this topic, and all of a sudden I was introduced to my cookbook mentor, who's in the audience, Sheila Kaufman. She's doing a presentation later today. And she said, I'd like to help you write a book. So that was the history of how this book got started. Now, Egyptian cuisine, a lot of times it gets introduced as a melting pot cuisine. But that's kind of, it's not really fair to say that. There are 19 different cuisines that were influenced by the cuisine of Egypt. And Egypt was also influenced by many other cuisines. And we're going to talk about those today. I'm going to demo two recipes for you. The first one is called ful madamis, which is a type of fava bean. These are the little favas. They are actually called um, ful madamis in Arabic. And they are the world's oldest agricultural crop. So they've been around for a long time. They're very healthful, and they have a lot of protein. Normally, these beans are soaked 
and then they're cooked for eight hours in what we call a damasa, which is this kind of a cylindrical shaped pot. It could be cooked over coals, and this is a street food. This is something that's very inexpensive. It's been around since the pre-Pharaonic times, in Nubian times, and Egyptians have been eating them forever, so they're very easy to come by. In a traditional meal, you might eat them for breakfast, along with uh, tameya, which is an Egyptian kind of falafel, also made with fava beans, and different types of salad and feta-like cheeses and yogurt. So they have very savory big breakfasts in Egypt, and this is part of that. In order to make this recipe, what I'm going to do is make sure I have my stove on, and then I'm going to heat up some olive oil. Now, you all should have the recipe packets right there in your, uh, on your seat. If you don't have one, they can give you one. But I start with olive oil. Whenever you look at a different cuisine, it's important to think about the type of fat that they use. And traditionally in Egypt, they would use something called samna, which is an aged clarified butter, very similar to ghee in the Indian kitchen, if you're familiar with that. So they would always start cooking with that. Over the years, as corn was introduced, corn became the fat of choice. And people started using corn oil. I'm using olive oil because it's what we have here. It's great in the Mediterranean diet. But if you go to a home in Egypt, you might find that they're using corn oil. And on the recipe, that's why I tell you to use corn oil. And I also mention expeller pressed corn oil. Because whenever you're working with a vegetable oil, you'll find that if it's a commercially prepared vegetable oil in the States, they extract the oil with a heat type of method. And this often uses chemicals. One of the chemicals is called hexane, which is a dry cleaner chemical. So we don't want that in our food. So always look for expeller pressed if you're going to get a vegetable oil. So while my oil is just heating up, I can kind of simmer it around the pan here. And then I'm going to add in my beans. Can you all see through the mirror what these beans look like? Everyone can see? Yeah? OK. So these are large fava beans. Um, you can use the small or the medium. Normally, they use small or medium. But what they bought for me today uh, here is the large one. So I'm going to go with those. In Egypt, these large ones go by a different name. They're, they make a dish called bisara, not full madamas. So keep in mind, these are much bigger than what we would normally be using. And to that, I'm going to add some cumin. Cumin has been around for a long time. It's a very old spice. And it's very good for digestion. Even little babies in Egypt, when they have colic or they have a problem like that, they'll usually make a tea for them with the cumin. It's called uh, cuminea, kamunea, and they'll give them that to kind of calm them down. So we always pair it with beans. It's a very traditional kind of pairing. Now, something for people to know who are newcomers to the Egyptian diet, fava beans and cumin require a special enzyme in order for our bodies to be able to digest them. And some people lack this enzyme. So if you ever hear about people having trouble with, with fava beans, there's actually something called favism, which can make you sick if you eat the raw fava beans. So it's important to know that. But if you cook them, you should be OK. And as you get used to the, the fool, you should also be OK with those. When you start to smell these things coming together, the ingredients, this is kind of what it smells like midday into uh, through lunchtime in Egypt. You get these flavors of a lot of the spices. If you're not used to cumin, and you want to kind of tone down the taste a little bit, the sharpness of the cumin, a spice that pairs well with cumin is coriander, which is dried cilantro. So just add a little bit of cumin and a, and a little bit more coriander, and you'll kind of get yourself used to the flavor. I find that people um, aren't always used to those. So now I'm going to just add a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And we'll let these cook for a minute. How many of you have been to Egypt before? So quite a few. Have any of you eaten the food? <laughs> That's great. OK, so fool has kind of like a bad rap in Egypt. You know, it's for the local people, they make fun of it because it's very cheap and it's very expensive. Egyptians love meat, as do a lot of people in the Middle East. But, and that dates all the way back to Bedouin times. But meat, unfortunately, nowadays is really expensive. It costs to get a kilo of meat, which is about 2.2 pounds. It costs what an average worker earns in, for the half month salary. So it's very, very expensive. So people look for a lot of meat substitutes. Another time that you would be looking for a meat substitute in Egypt would be during the time of Lent. Because the Coptic Christians, when they observe the Lenten 55 days before Easter, they consume a vegan diet. 
They don't have any dairy products, any meat, any fish, anything like that. So because this is a meat-loving culture, and all of a sudden for so many days of the year you have to have a vegan diet, the, the Christian community has these wonderful vegan fasting dishes that are good meat substitutes. So I always tell people, if you're vegan, look to the Egyptian community, look to the Ethiopian community, Syrians, anybody who's Eastern Orthodox, because they will have developed really wonderful uh, vegan-type recipes. So these are the full, and now what I'm going to do is just mash them. You want to take a potato masher and just kind of squish them down like this. Now these are a little bit harder to do because they're the big ones, but at home when you do the little ones, you'll find that it's very easy, and it takes a matter of um, seconds. And then think of your fool as a bed. It's like kind of a, a blank canvas of protein that you could add any kind of flavor that you like to um, to serve it your way. So one of the ways that I would do this would be to serve it uh, with a tahini sauce on top. And not just the tahini straight out of the jar, but the one that you've worked with a little bit of lemon juice and garlic and salt and pepper and water to make it a nice thin consistency. You could drizzle that over the top. You could drizzle more olive oil over the top. Or sometimes they do a very ch finely chopped salad with cucumbers and tomatoes and radishes and onions. And they just sprinkle that in a little mound on top. And that looks very pretty and it's very nutritious too. So, as I was mentioning about the people loving the meat and how important that is to the culture and how they take fool for granted. An insider's joke is, over the years I spent a lot of times doing different things in Egypt. Sometimes I do restaurant consulting, sometimes I was doing uh, nonprofit type volunteer work, sometimes I was visiting family and friends, but um, it's always around the kitchen. And so when I'd be working in the kitchen with the other chefs, if I'd show up one day and, you know, kitchen work is hot, it's heavy, and sometimes it's hard to focus. So if I'd ever be a little bit out of it or hard to focus, they'd tell me, oh, Amy, what's wrong? Did you have full for breakfast? Or if you're tired and you can't keep up, oh, did you have full for breakfast? It's always like a joke. Any, no matter what bad happens in the society, they blame it on fool. But yet they eat it every day. So it's, it's, a, it's a funny little paradox to know about the Egyptian culture. So I'm going to serve up just a little bit in here. And normally in Egypt, you would not serve this in a bowl like this. You would serve it in a flat plate. But just for um, the purpose of today's demo, they've done a wonderful job for us of uh, getting the convention center ready today on a very short notice. So you make kind of like a little bed in here. And then you drizzle some lemon juice over the top. Or you can drizzle it right in here. I always do it at the end because Egyptians love citrus. But if you put it during the cooking, it changes kind of the consistency of the cooking and you lose the flavor. If you hit it right at the end, it's very good. And there's also important medicinal benefits for that because, you know, lemon is a really good antiseptic. So if you're ever eating street food in a foreign country or like raw fish or, or meat and you're worried it could be, have anything kind of contamination, always hit it with some lemon juice and that will be very good. Um, people are still you know, concerned about the evil eye in Egypt, and they're concerned about things like poisoning. So a lot of the older generation, like old men, will carry a lemon with them in their pocket. And if they suspect anything funny, they'll just cut it and drizzle it over the food. So um, it's everywhere. So that's what it looks like in the end. And the way that you would eat this would be to take the pita and just break it like this. It would always be warm. And then to go like this with your three fingers, this is important because I see a lot of people doing weird things with pita. They get a spoon and they try to put it on. Or but you just, you have your three fingers like this and you bring your fourth one in and then you scoop and you put it this way. And this is the way that you eat it. So that's how you deal with the pita. Now it's important to know bread is very important in Egypt. In the ancient times, they used to ration for the pyramid laborers five pounds of bread per day per person with beer. And you can see how thin those pyramid laborers were. So my theory is, if you exercise enough, you can eat as much bread as you like. And bread is very, very important to the Egyptians. The word in Arabic for bread is aish, which means to live. So bread is literally life. And in Egypt, th this is not it. You can't get it in the United States. But the variety of bread that they have, and I have the recipe in my book, and I have all the history of the different kinds of bread, but it is called aish baladi, which means local life. So that's how important the bread is. And you will see, if you go to Egypt, people carrying trays about four times the size of this, young boys, on their head, they'll be bicycling, and the tray will be full of bread. One of those trays will be for one family of four or six people, and they'll eat that bread in the course of a day. 
and the next day they'll go to the bakery and they'll get more bread. But bread is eaten with everything. Even if you eat French fries, they scoop up the French fries with bread. So it's a whole different way of thinking about bread than the way we do, which we're like, you know, no bread, stay away from the bread. They have lots of bread and, they, and they're very happy with it. Now, Aishbaladi is different from regular pita because it's made with a different type of grains and also with bran. And what they do is they sprinkle the bran on the bottom and they bake it that way so it puffs up nice and high. And they have it in three different uh, types of moisture. They have normal, dry, and very dry. And that way, depending upon what kind of food you're going to be scooping up with the bread, you know exactly which type of, of one to buy. So it's very, very important in Egypt, and, you, and we can't overlook the importance of bread. When the Romans came into Egypt in the first century, the reason why they did was to obtain all of the wheat. Because with the wheat that they got in Egypt, they could provide that to the whole entire Roman Empire, which spanned into what is nowadays um, the UK. As you notice, my book is called Nile Style, and I talk a lot about Ni the Nile, I talk about the Mediterranean, I talk about the Red Sea a lot with Egypt. And my reason for that is because everybody knows about the desert. You can turn on the Discovery Channel or C-SPAN or any of those and see how much desert there is in Egypt. But when you go to Egypt for the first time, what really struck me was the water. And when you think about the water, you know, it's not just a beautiful beach resort that we can go to and enjoy, but these were the ancient railways. These were the ancient uh, transportation w means that people could go through to get things from Africa to Asia and to Europe and beyond. So these, these waterways were what enabled the Egyptian empire to exist, and especially the Nile. Um, the Nile was a sacred river. The Nile used to flood twice a year, naturally. So this flooding provided all of the irrigation for all of Egypt, so they didn't have to create fancy aqueducts or anything. They were just naturally blessed with all of this bounty. And food in antiquity was currency. It's very important to think of that. It's not like, you know, people didn't go with dollars to buy things. They went literally with fava beans or with grains of wheat or with incense or with spices, and that's how they traded and bought things. So whoever had the majority of the agricultural products had the majority of the wealth. And that's what led us to, to do all the great things in Egypt that they were able to do. Um, some of the culinary diplomacy dates back to the 1500, before the Common Era. And this would be the time of Hatshepsut, who is the female pharaoh. We find in front of her temple, there is a tree that she traded with the land of Punt, which scholars disagree nowadays. Some people say this is Ethiopia. Some people say this is Djibouti, Yemen. They go a little bit back and forth. Some people say it's in the Arabian Peninsula. But the, it's in the Red Sea between Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. We're sure of that. And so Hatshepsut was sending envoys there, and she was trading with them. During her reign, there was peace, and there was a lot of prosperity. So a lot of people, when they look to diplomacy, they start actually in uh, Greece and in Rome, but we can look even further to Egypt and even further into Sub-Saharan Africa to get a lot of these types of tips and ideas of, of so many great things that were happening in antiquity. And that leads me to the next recipe, which is karkade. Karkade is hibiscus tea. Have any of you ever had hibiscus before to drink? Okay, so it's a great ingredient, and the Egyptians are not only the only ones who have it. It can be found all around um, the world, actually, nowadays. And it's a very interesting story when I'll tell you. But what I'm going to do, I have my boiling water here, and I'm going to add some of my um, tea bags right into it and just let that um, steep for a minute. So I'll turn off my temperature. And I'm just going to let this steep. It's going to turn into a beautiful, bright red ruby color. But hibiscus is a Nubian ingredient. There is an ancient land of Nubia that often gets left out. I, I'm often invited to do a lot of lectures at Georgetown for the school kids when sixth grade when they study Egypt, and we always talk about ancient Egypt, and hardly anybody ever talks about Nubia. But Nubia is really important because from about 5500, before the Common Era, until about uh, 150 of the Common Era, there was this land that spanned from what is nowadays Khartoum in Sudan all the way to Aswan in Egypt, and this was what is known as Nubia. The Nubians ruled Egypt together for 100 years. They had 27 different kings during this century who were of sub-Saharan African descent, and they ruled Egypt. So there was a lot of influence going on between Egypt and sub-Saharan Africa that sometimes we don't talk about. And it's very important culinarily because these types of ingredients like hibiscus, like okra, 
like uh, spices, like something called melochea, which in, Egypt, in English we call it Jew's mallow. This was all from Nubia. So we can go back to the Nubians. There's a wonderful Nubian museum in Aswan. We can study about this. And also in Luxor, which is uh, not considered to be what Nubia actually is, but there are 50,000 displaced Nubians now living in Luxor. We have an open air village called the, the Nubian village that you can go and witness. And the Nubians speak their own language still until today. It's a Meroitic language. It's spoken, but it's not written. And so a newcomer to Egypt, it might be hard for them to tell who's Nubian and who's Egyptian, but if you know Arabic or if you know Egyptian, you've been a long time, you can tell the difference. And they have wonderful wedding ceremonies and very, very beautiful celebrations and things like that that they do. They have uh, stucco kind of homes that they have very bright, colorful, geometric designs. Some of the designs which we think of nowadays as um, Sephardic or as Arabesque were actually Nubian and you can find that they were there earlier. So it's a very wonderful culture to go back and study and to learn about. So I've got my hibiscus over here and it's just been steeping for a minute. These type of stoves are very, very hot. Do any of you have these flat surfaces at home? You'll find that you have to kind of adjust your cooking because it takes them a while to get hot, but once they hit the temperature, they really, really come up. So even though I turned this off, my tea is actually boiling. So you always wanna be cognizant of that. A lot of these types of recipes that are written in older cultures didn't have these stoves. So if they tell you to turn it off, take it right off the heat so that it doesn't keep cooking. Now I'm going to move this up front because I want you to see this beautiful ruby color of the tea. Can you see that in the mirror? See, that's such a pretty color. What I'm going to do now is scoop out my tea bags. You can also buy the hibiscus leaves uh, dry and you can buy them whole. You don't have to buy it in the tea bags, but it's, luckily nowadays, it's readily available because so many cultures use it. And I'll explain actually why that is in a second. Might be easier if we do it this way. So hibiscus is very good for us. It has a lot of vitamin C in it, and it actually is something which has been proven to lower blood pressure. So anybody who suffers from high blood pressure this can be something that you can drink at home and it will help you lower it. It can be eat, drink hot or cold. I like it cold, I tend to favor it. It's very kind of astringent if it doesn't have sugar in it. It's um, similar to kind of a cranberry, raw cranberry taste. So think about that if you're, if you're going to make it. You want to always add sugar. And the Nubians and the Sudanese and the Egyptians love sugar. Sugar has been in Egypt since about 525 before the Common Era. It was brought by the Persians. So back in the day when the Greeks and the Romans, everybody was like dreaming of sugar, and even the recipes that were made for the gods didn't have sugar in them yet because it was too expensive. In Egypt, they had a huge amount of sugar. So that's how you, you get these um, very sweet recipes. So what I'm going to do to this is just add a little bit of sugar in. And you can make this into ice cubes or popsicles. And nowadays, they're adding it into a lot of drinks. You'll find it in simple syrups. You'll find people making cosmopolitans out of it and martinis. But more and more, um, it's on a lot of different restaurant menus. Now, this is something called orange blossom water. Have any of you worked with orange blossom water? OK, so some of you. You can find it in North African food, in Middle Eastern food, Indian, and also um, in some of the food of Naples in Italy and in Provence in southern France. What this is, is it's the essential oil from the flower of the orange tree. When the, when the oranges blossom, a flower comes before them. And if you ever drive through an orange grove at that time in the spring, if you close your eyes, it smells like this beautiful musky perfume. It smells just like what's in this bottle. And it's a wonderful little flavor enhancer. You can add it to syrups or to different things. And I'm going to pass it around so you all can smell it. and I'm just gonna stir this up together. Now, if you wanted to serve this cold, what you would do is just let it come to room temperature and then put it in the refrigerator. And then when you go to serve it, put it in a shaker and shake it really hard and pour it into a glass. You're going to have about this much of a beautiful ruby color and then on top you're gonna have a nice thick white foam. So it's very beautiful and very dramatic and very healthy. But again, like the Fool, because it's readily available and it's something that people eat a lot, 
they kind of make fun of it and take advantage of it. When I went, when I was doing my research, I got to go not to the Nubian village that's like a museum, but to the real Nubian village where the people live. And I got to have meetings with the tribal elders and all the kids were drinking Pepsi and Coke and they brought me this as a traditional drink. So it's just kind of a sign of the times. You won't find a lot of, you know, um, upper crust Egyptians going to restaurants ordering karkade, but at home they're drinking it. When they're sick, they're drinking it. Um, as a comfort, they're kind of drinking it. And to cool down in the summer, they're drinking it. But it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to enjoy. So karkade has a really interesting history. Those of you who speak Spanish might know it as agua de Jamaica or Jamaican water. Uh, those of you who have any type of roots in Western Africa might, or Central Africa might know it as VSOP. And that's because of the migration. So originally indigenous to the area of Nubia, and that's when uh, the Nubians were making it. And then something very interesting happened in history. And this is a little bit of a long story. I need you to stick with me, but it's very interesting. In terms of food, it's probably one of the most important times in our history, uh, modern times, of food. This took place in the 10th century in the palaces of Iraq, in Baghdad. This was the time when the Abbasid Caliphate was in control. And they would employ people in the palaces who were like trendsetters. They were the people who we would think of nowadays as like a Martha Stewart, who would kind of be in control of taking care of everything and making sure that in the palace, people were living the good life. But they were men. And also in this time, anybody who was educated would have many titles. So free education was available to the masses. If you were a philosopher at that time, you were probably also a doctor and an astronomer and an astrologist and a poet and a pharmacist. You might have eight or nine different slashes in your job title. And it, it went that way all the way down the casts. So someone who was a really well-respected chef would also be well-known in the areas of fashion and in kind of lifestyle trends and health and many other areas. So there was a gentleman named Abul Hassan who went by the nicknamed Ziryab, which meant blackbird. And he was called that because he had a beautiful voice that sounded like a blackbird. So this gentleman was employed by the palaces in Iraq. And when his term was over, he was recruited by the palaces in Andalusia, which is what is now Andalusia. In those days, they didn't call it that yet. Because the, uh, the uh, Umayyads, who were a rivalry caliphate to the Abbasids, set up shop in southern Spain. And they wanted to make southern Spain just as cosmopolitan as Baghdad was. So they figured if they hired these people who were known for this in Iraq, that they could introduce this high level of society in southern Spain. So they employed Ziryab to come all the way from Iraq over. And they asked him to stop along the way and bring things with him. So he stopped in Egypt. And in Egypt, he brought hibiscus, and he brought okra, he brought rice, and he brought spices like saffron, and he introduced them into southern Spain. Now, some of these ingredients really took off. We know that the rice and the saffron turned themselves into paella, which is pretty much the, un, you know, the national dish of this region of Spain. If you look at my first cookbook, which is called Arabian Delights, you'll find a recipe for something called kabsa. Kabsa is the Saudi Arabian grandfather of the modern day paella. And you can see that direct lineage through Zerayab. Now, hibiscus never caught on in Spain, and okra never caught on in Spain. But when the Spaniards colonized areas like the Caribbean and brought them to the New World and Mexico, they brought these ingredients with them, which is why in Mexico they have agua de Jamaica, which means Jamaican water, uh, because it was introduced to the Caribbean. So you can find a lot of similarities just from this one ingredient of a whole trail that goes all the way from Africa to the New World and now to the United States. So hibiscus is becoming more and more popular. You're gonna see it in more and more ingredients. And there are many things like that in ancient Egypt that you'll find, uh, licorice root, which is something that Egyptians drink as a, as a very common kind of a, a tonic. It's been, Cleopatra drank it. They drank it all the way since ancient times. Nowadays, modern doctors are actually making pills out of licorice root and selling it. And they, you know, they'll prescribe it to people just to kind of to make them feel better and boost their immunity. About, there was, in the ancient texts that we have from, from Egypt that were discovered in 1973, the British Pharmaceutical Codex proved that about 66% of what the ancient Egyptians had found in terms of medicine was accurate. And I always tell people that doesn't mean that the other 34% wasn't accurate. It just means that we haven't proven its accuracy yet. So there are a lot of things that we can look towards uh, to find in terms of today uh, with these ancient ingredients. 
So these are my first two recipes for today. Um, as I mentioned, I will take uh, some question and answers. But beforehand, I'd like you to introduce you to some people. Uh, you've met my mentor, and I, I, I encourage, encourage you to come back and be here for her presentation on Turkish cuisine. It's going to be wonderful. And for those of you who have uh, the pamphlets there that are sitting down, you'll see something for my culinary cruise. In October, I'm leading a culinary cruise from Istanbul to Athens. And in the back, we have Chef Luigi Diotayuti. Luigi is the owner of El Tiramisu restaurant on P Street, which is Washington's most authentic Italian restaurant. And we're going to be leading this culinary cruise together. There's still a couple seats available if anyone's interested, but it goes from Istanbul to Athens and around the Greek Isles. We're also working on a lot of uh, food documentaries and different television projects together, so stay tuned for that. And I would love to open up the floor for questions and answers, so please come to the microphone so that everybody can hear you and that you can be recorded. Yes. Thank you very much. I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, where can you get the tea? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, in the handouts, um, you have some where to buy guides. But actually, the hibiscus tea is available in a lot of places. You can find it even at Whole Foods. But if you want to go to a Mediterranean or Middle Eastern store so you can get more Egyptian things, um, on your handout, there's the Mediterranean Bakery in Alexandria, Virginia. And in uh, Bailey's Crossroads in Falls Church, you will find Aphrodite. Greek and Mediterranean imports. And they've got really authentic Egyptian um, foods there. OK, one more question. Yes. If I wanted to switch the beans, yes. could I use any other kind of beans that's here local in the Washington area? Like uh, lima yes. beans? OK. Yeah, sure. You can, you can do the same kind of uh, production with, with lima beans, with like a runner bean, with a broad bean, whatever you like. It's just that the fava are traditional because that's what they had there. But if you season up other beans this way, they'll taste wonderful. And the benefit is a lot of those other beans that are available locally, especially this is the time when a lot of beans are fresh, yes. um, they take less time to cook. So you don't have to wait the eight hours. You can do the fresh ones, and they'll be cooked more quickly. Thank it's a very you. good question. Yes. yes. Hello. Um, I have two, two questions. One is you mentioned that uh, to counter the cumin, you can use coriander, but yes. is it the seed? Or oh, that's the a good question. Sure. So just uh, I'll answer that one first. Uh, for everybody who's not familiar with the spice coriander, the spices come in seeds, and then they ground them. Coriander is dried cilantro. And I say that over because in every other language that I've ever encountered, they have one word for coriander or cilantro. We're the only one that has two. Even in England, they call it fresh coriander and dried coriander. But we call the fresh one cilantro for some reason. So if you use the dried one, the coriander, if you use the seeds, you can put them in whole, which they do sometimes in Egypt. You can kind of squash them and do it half and half, or you can do it completely ground. That's up to you. And the only reason I give everybody that tip of adding coriander with or instead of cumin is because I actually experienced that problem where I, I could not digest cumin when I first started going to Egypt. It was making me very sick. But I knew if I was going to be spending a lot of time there, I'd kind of have to get used to it. So I worked myself up. So I would just cook it myself a little bit at a time. And every time I cooked, I added a little bit more and a little bit more until I got used to it. And now, I, now I'm fine. Yeah. The other part is the, um, the hibiscus. You say the leaves, but they're green, and it's the flower that's red. So is it the flower that's being the used? The flower. I'm sorry. If I said uh, the leaves, I misspoke. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, these are the dried hibiscus flowers. Okay. Correct. And right. sometimes uh, the proper botanical name, they use sorrel instead of uh, hibiscus. So you can find them with that name also. Um, why is the tea a favorite? Why is the tea a, fav a favorite? A favorite? Because it tastes really good. And it's good for you. And it's a pretty color. And it's available everywhere. I think if you try some, you'll like it. Good question. Any other questions? Well, I thank you all for coming. And I'm going to be doing a book signing a little bit later at 1 o'clock, so I hope you come. Oh, one, another question, OK. I also would like to recommend everybody, um, I didn't have time. You know, it takes a whole semester to talk about everything that's available in Egypt. So there wasn't enough time today. But I've done a podcast at the Library of Congress called Understanding Egyptian Cuisine and Culture. And that tells the Cliff Note version from beginning to end. So check out the Library of Congress website. You can see that one. I also have uh, the Cuisine and Culture of the Arab World. 
So you'll be able to look at those. I have a YouTube channel, and you have all my contact, I believe, on those handouts. So you can see any videos. I also have Egyptian cooking videos. If you want to learn how to make kushri, Egyptian lemonade, busbusa, any of those things, as well as many other culture foods, are all in my YouTube channel. Thank you. Can just uh, what's what's your favorite meat recipe that would go with that wonderful fava bean recipe? Oh, that's a great question. There are so many of them, um, and in the book I have many. I have things like kofta and kebab. Um, depending on what he likes, you know, there are many different kinds of kebabs, and they're all in that recipe, and they're great because. You know, they're similar. Americans are used to grilling things, but these are just changing up the spices a little bit to make them Egyptian style. They're easy, they're healthy, they're good. And then there's something else called kofta, which are like uh, croquettes. They're ground meat that you make out like a meatball, but you do make it in the shape of a cylinder, and you can either fry them or grill them. And they, they would go very well also with the fool. A good question. Any other questions? Okay, well, I thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.